prepare to apply this understanding in order to deposit research data and explain how sharing research data satisfies government and funder mandates and relates to the broader picture of open science. Next slide. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Stefan Kramer. I'd like to start us out by discussing some reasons why you might share research data. The first reason, the first bullet here, um, is related to this being for the benefit of science for other researchers around the world, but also for the general public, for policymakers who may benefit from having access to research data or journalists or students, for example. The second item here, the second bullet, increasing citations, means that researchers that find research data in a repository that is linked to the article or to other empirical work that is based on that data may increase the exposure or the reading or the citation of that work. In other words, the data, first seeing the data, may lead readers to the discussion of the data and to the derived findings in a journal article or similar work and getting more readers and citations of your published work is desirable for most faculty. The third bullet is kind of related to that. Um, there are still many articles and certainly books, academic books behind paywalls that exclude considerable parts of the global audience. But the researcher usually has the option of making the data they collect openly available unless there are considerations for making it restricted use data. And I'll touch upon that a little more uh, later when we talk about ICPSR. Um, the fourth bullet here, because a research funder publisher simply requires it, um, relates to the fact that particularly over about the last 10 to 12 years, the increasing number of funders have begun to require that the data whose collection they ultimately fund as part of sponsored research be made available as widely as possible, especially if that's taxpayer funded. But foundations are also more and more demanding that. And then journal publishers have certainly increasingly required availability of the data underlying articles that they publish to make it possible for others to validate and replicate the reported findings from the empirical work. And the last bullet there, that's a reference to the sharing of data sets and other research outputs in the AU Tenure Promotion and Reappointment Guidelines updates resource that is mentioned there. So that, that is also appears there. Next slide, please. So we'll talk about some data repository options for AU faculty from here on. Um, at the URL in that first bullet there is a relatively new document that I created for OZARA um, to distribute to EU faculty who are pursuing external funding. But it's also relevant in good part to non-sponsored research. That has more details than we're discussing here about some specific repositories and particularly the cost considerations of submitting research data to them which relates to writing um, the costs of data sharing into grants. Uh, the second bullet there is relates to, we have a listserv list for AU faculty for research uh, related announcements and discussion. There's information on how to subscribe to that. So the purpose of that list is twofold. Um, one, it's for AU faculty to share with each other um, lessons or questions about uh, teaching or researching with research data. And then secondly, uh, from CTRL and the library announcements related to data related news, services, events, resources of all sorts. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, um, there are an increasing number of agencies, government agencies that require data sharing that started in I think around 2005 with NIH, they had a requirement, although it was kind of, as people said, it didn't have many teeth, but then particularly the National Science Foundation in 2011 led the way in requiring data sharing and data management plans. 
And since then, most federal agencies in the US have developed their own policies about that and in other countries as well. The Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, or SPARC for short, has uh, compiled a list that collects these requirements from the different agencies but it's not necessarily up to date and it's difficult to keep such a list up to date. So if you are planning to um, apply for funding from a specific federal agencies, you should always check on the latest policy of that agency on their website. Um, here's an example. There's a page from the Institute of Education Sciences in the Department of Education that outlines what they expect in terms of uh, data sharing for research that they fund. And lastly, the DMP or data management plan tool, which is uh, developed by the University of California, but used by universities around the world, has templates for data management plans for different fund funders, uh, government agencies, as well as many foundations. When you go there to dmptool.org, you may notice at the upper right hand corner there's a login and you can log in there with your AU credentials to see some AU specific resources. And some of those we will discuss today. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as I mentioned just a short while ago, um, in the last dozen or so years, just about every federal agency sponsoring research has developed their own data sharing policy. Um, and last year, this document on desirable characteristics of data repositories for federally funded research was published for other, among other reasons, to bring more consistency to this landscape, to guide the, the federal agencies, um, to give more consistent advice to researchers of what they expect in terms of repository selection um, for research data. But it also lists in some detail what attributes the data repositories should have. And repository platform developers, as well as research institutions, such as us, that use data repositories are paying attention to it, or at least they should. Um, this is going to develop over the next couple of years. There are specific deadlines by when specific federal agencies have to adhere to that. And in a little bit, Rachel will talk about a use implementation of Figshare. And that's in the second bullet there. Figshare has released a document specifically addressing that, how that platform uh, meets desirable characteristics for data repositories. Next slide, please. ICPSR, the Interuniversity Consortium for Political and Social Research, is one good option for sharing data in the social, behavioral, and related disciplines. It is housed at the University of Michigan. It has been around for over 60 years now and counts hundreds of member organizations, including the American University. On the right side of that slide, there are some useful web links um, related to ICPSR. Now, the cost of data curation or sharing data publicly available by ICPSR should be written into um, grants because most of the data that ICPSR houses is only made available to users at ICPSR paying member organizations by default. That is their business model. ICPR, ICPSR is largely financed by dues from member organizations. So they make most of the data only available to member organizations and their users, faculty, students, staff, etc. However, since that does not satisfy the open data requirements of many funders who want to see global open data access, you can write and you should write if you want to pursue this option, the cost of data curation by ICPSR into a grant, then ICPSR can make the data available openly so nobody has to pay for access. Um, we're talking about repositories here in general, open, publicly accessible repositories, but I wanted to mention ICP ICPSR also operates data enclaves that are require uh, uh, applications and applications to access them 
for restricted use data. That is data that cannot simply be made publicly accessible in a repository because it has sensitive content, risks of disclosure of participants and so forth. So for that, ICPSR has physical and virtual data enclaves. And the document I mentioned earlier calling making your research data available via repository, some options for AU faculty uh, has more information on ICPSR regarding the issues that I just discussed here. And now it's over to Rachel for a discussion of AU's new repository, the AU Research Archive. Thank you. And next slide, please. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so as Stefan mentioned, I'm here to talk about uh, AU's uh, option for depositing data, qualitative research data, and making openly available. Uh, we have off operated an institutional repository for a number of years. Um, so the concept is not new, but uh, for those of you who may be familiar with, with our institutional repository may know it by a different name, Audra, or the AU Digital Research Archive. Uh, we are in the process of moving platforms. Um, and as Stefan mentioned, our new platform is um, FigShare, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, it, debuted in a soft launch, which means it is active and live now, but we had, this is actually our first time talking about it uh, with more than one person at a time. Um, but it is currently an, an active place where you can self-deposit data sets as well as other materials um, that you want to make openly available, though there, there are options for limiting um, or restricting access to content. So some reasons that you might want to use Aura or the AU's institutional repository. Um, it uh, not only makes it findable, it makes it searchable. Uh, many of the different types of materials, including data sets that you put into our archive, then get indexed in Google Scholar um, or other appropriate um, online resources um, so that others can find your work. Uh, it is all self driven. So that means you will be uploading the material yourself and adding appropriate descriptors, keywords, and other metadata. Um, it assigns DOIs by default, and I'll talk about the benefits of DOIs in a few slides. But one of the neater options that our faculty have responded to, or the few faculty that have used this so far in our, during our soft launch, is that you can reserve a DOI. Um, so normally, in order to get a DOI, you need to make information publicly available. But if you are in the process of publishing an article and want to publish the data to go alongside it, you really want the article to be published before the data is made available. Um, so if you use Aura, um, you can upload your data set and then reserve the DOI, copy it and send it or include it in your publication before is publicly available. And then uh, once the publication comes out, you can come back into Aura and then set it to public setting. Um, so there's a few different options for how widely you share that DOI. Um, and you can do the same thing with the URL as well. Um, you can also directly link data to a publication. There's two fields. It's called related title and related DOI. Um, so that if someone comes across your data set and isn't aware of the publication that it's tied to, it will automatic, it will direct um, users there in a little box that's on the page. Um, there are options to collaborate with non-AU people and have them deposit materials into the institutional repository. Um, please contact us before you plan to do this, uh, just because we do have to pay. Um, for the gigabytes and the terabytes that we use to operate the institutional repository. Um, so in special circumstances, we can um, make that option available. For example, the recipes grant, um, all of the researchers in that multi-institutional sponsored research uh, will be putting their data sets into Aura um, through use of something called a project, which is a Figshare feature. Um, and finally, Aura has embedded metrics. So you can see how many times your data set has been viewed or downloaded. Um, if it does have any alt metrics, um, if you're familiar with the alt metric attention score, um, this tracks a whole variety of different ways that uh, your research, or in this case, your data set can be shared, cited, used in a non-scholarly context. And if any of that has happened, you'll be able to see it right within the institutional repository. So on the right-hand side, we've got some helpful links. If you want to go and check out what we have there so far, 
Um, or if you want to log in, aura.american.edu, um, faculty will automatically have an account. So if you click on login, it'll ask you to log in with your AU credentials. And with Duo, my apologies, but this is one of the Duo sites <laughs> on campus. Um, if you are staff or students, uh, you can still get an account. And that second link, the deposit instructions, has a link to where to request an account. It's an automatic process. It doesn't take long. You don't need me to approve your account or anything like that. Um, Stefan earlier had mentioned how Figshare meets the requirements um, for NIH's requirements for desirable characteristics of a data set. Um, but there's other forms of compliance, and Figshare actually keeps uh, records of how they are in compliance with various mandates um, in that third link there. Um, so for example, if you haven't heard of the OSTP memo, so it's kind of the, the sister uh, policy to the data one uh, that Stefan was talking about, but this is instead of focusing on data is uh, focusing on making um, any funded research that's funded by the government, the US government, all of the publications have to be made immediately open access. Uh, right now, some of the agencies have an open access requirement, but with a 12 month embargo. So within 12 months, you have to make it openly available. By 2026, that is going away and all agencies, if you have uh, funding with any of them, your research must be made immediately openly available. So again, that compliance page talks about how Figshare is working with the OSTP memo. Though at this point, uh, since it is kind of in the future, government agencies are still working out what that's going to look like. Uh, part of my job is also open access, so I'll be keeping up on that. But there's a very decent chance that um, our institutional repository will be a main way by which you can make research openly available as well. Um, finally, if you want to know which databases exactly those different types of research outputs um, are getting indexed, that last link can help you figure out what type, um, because not all, uh, depending on the type of the item type that you select as you're uploading, it gets indexed in different locations. Um, so just to talk briefly, if you have used fig figshare.com, it is a freely available product. Um, so, uh, and it looks very, very similar <laughs> to Aura. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the differences. Um, with figshare.com, it's free to use. You can um, register for an account and it has a lot of the same benefits and features that I just talked about. The upload page looks very similar. It's got DOIs that you can reserve. You can create group collaborative projects. So some of the benefits of using Aura is that it does come with the AU branding. So you can collect all of your research materials and have it associated with American University. Um, we can give you more space than Figshare.com does. Uh, we start with giving you 10 gigabytes, but uh, I think we'll, this hasn't happened yet, but we intend to have fairly lenient policies within reason, um, just to make sure that you have the space that you need to upload the materials that you want to upload. Um, there's also some more options to customize that are specific to the AU community. So you can embargo content. Um, so if you wanted to restrict access for the first six months and then open it up at a later date, that is a possibility. Um, you can also restrict access to the AU community. And we actually do already have a syllabus uh, in the live repository that is only available to AU community members. So that means that they either have to be within the AU IP range or they have to be logged in through Aura in order to access the content. So that is also an option for anyone who wants some access, but it does not want to go public with their material. And last but not least, not to toot my own horn and Stefan's, but if you use Aura, uh, Stefan and I are here to assist. Um, so especially if you have questions about the metadata, aren't sure uh, how you should be inputting information. If you run into some errors, we are here to help with any and all of that. Or uh, at American.edu goes to both of us. And last but not least, um, I promised that I would talk about DOIs. There are a number of reasons why DOIs are wonderful and really drive um, how we track research online. Um, so Aura assigns a DOI or a digital object identifier. I like to uh, refer to it as kind of a, a social security number, but for research outputs. Um, just like ORCID is a unique ID number that's assigned to a researcher. These are numbers that are assigned to individual journal articles, data sets, or other research materials. Um, 
So there's an example if you want to look at one, but they provide a global persistent way to track information. Um, as we know, or you may know, <laughs> URLs can sometimes disappear or change over time. DOS are designed to uh, be more reliable than using a new URL. So for example, we are moving a whole bunch of our institutional repository materials from our legacy archive, Audra, into the new one, Aura. And all of those, most of those materials have DOIs. We will be going through in the back end and updating what the resolution URL is, or when you click on a DOI, where does it actually take you? Um, so that's our responsibility. And the, the responsibility of people who mint DOIs is to make sure that they are stable over time. Not only that, but we can use DOIs to track. And this is uh, when I talk about research impact, this is something that I mention a lot is that in order to track how your research is being used, we have to uh, have a common way to track it. And DOIs have been the most reliable way to track research outputs over time. So I mentioned the altmetric attention score earlier. On the right-hand side, you can see an example. This is actually from a research article produced by an AU faculty member um, talking about the effects of climate change on fisheries. Um, so you can see it's been picked up in a number of different outlets, and that is all thanks to the fact that that journal article has a DOI. I think that's up oh, there. We go. Um, and if you'd like more information, we have a subject guide. We have lots of subject guides about lots of information, but of course, if you don't find the information you need, that's when you should contact us. And with that, I am going to, I believe, oh, there's, sorry, one more way to contact us. A uh, data site at American.edu. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tiffany. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so what, what's up next is the qualitative data repository. And so with the data qualitative repository or QDR, it's a dedicated archive for storing and sharing digital data um, collected through qualitative and multi-method research in the social sciences and related disciplines. It is um, stored at Syracuse University. We do have a membership, but this membership does expire on June 30th of this year, just as a heads up. Um, if I had the pointer, I'd be circling. So Rachel, if you could circle <laughs> around June 30th of 2023, um, that'd be great. Um, but it, the, the, the repository does, um, our membership does end at that particular, thank you, Rachel, does end at that particular time. Um, and then you can see some links um, to the right hand side of the screen that is available for you as well. Um, next slide, please. So we've been talking a lot about um, some um, grants or excuse me, not grants, but some repositories that are available um, through NSF or now this is NIH. So with NIH, even though it's not qualitative, there are some that can be qualitative. If you look to the left, you'll find some definitions of what the National Library of Medicine has to offer. And then to the right, you'll see those links to those particular um, to those particular sites. And for instance, if you look at the second link or the second bullet, Domain-specific repositories are typically limited to data of a certain type or related to a certain discipline. So you have repositories that are connected with that particular link. So just um, just to kind of be aware of where you're looking for. So if you go if we go to the next slide, please, the generalist repositories. We know that Big Share is definitely connected on the NIH site. So these are some of the sites that are quantitative and mixed methods. Um, there some some of them are except for the big share one, which you can use for qualitative. But a lot of these um, are quant and mixed methods. Next slide, please. So just some resources and references: the Office of Research, IRB, CTRL, of course, and of course the library. We are all here for you, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and talking about repositories, I mean, this is what we're here for. Um, and then next slide. Oh, it's not coming up. I guess we have to click. Do you have any questions for us? 
<laughs> so Sylvia is asking, is there some kind of version of control in Aura in the sense that if some data is updated or improved, is the informed to the users or can you update it? A new DOI is issued. So that would be a Rachel question. Yeah, um, so there are a couple of different options. Uh, the default is that it, it does track versions and you can even, uh, there's a, a field where you can put, I think, addition, but you could always put in the description version two um, with maybe, you know, the date that it was updated, but, um, and why would be my recommendation. Um, it will say that it's version two that's being uploaded. Um, however, it will be the same DOI. Um, DOI DOIs aren't, aren't des are designed to link to the same thing, essentially. So um, if you wanted a new DOI for a different version, um, I would probably just start a new upload and maybe in that related um, title and DOI, you can link back to the previous version. And then, you know, if you have multiple versions over time, you can just chain one to the next version. So you can click your way back through the version history. Um, that would, I think, be my, my way to handle it. You're welcome. Uh, Jonathan had their hand up. Yeah, I have a question. I, I support, you know, um, open science, but one of the questions that I have, um, say you spent a couple of years collecting a data set and um, you're required by your funder or a publication to make it public. Can you, are there options for controlling who can access and use that data? Um, because, you know, you may not finish publishing off those data sets for years to come. I was just wondering if you would talk about that a little. Stefan, do you want to handle that one? Sure. Um... As far as I understand the concern, and many researchers have that, I, however, I am not aware of so far uh, research funders making provisions for that. Now, it's I think that is worth having conversations with um, program officers at funding agencies or foundations with, because that is a legitimate concern, and many research and doctoral students publish multiple. Um, instances of research outputs from the same data set. And yet, on the other hand, the research funders say, well, we, we're funding the collection of the data, so we want it to be available to everybody as soon as possible. So there's a definite tension, and I think that is a discussion that researchers need to have with their funders often and soon, if they haven't already. So is it possible that someone could just basically, you know, go in, take your data, and publish it under their own name? Um, so publish the actual data that you have put up there? No, not publish that, the data, but analyze it and publish it under their, no, their own name with no acknowledgement of you or no collaboration whatsoever? I think it is possible that they could do that, but that they would be violating the central tenet of academia when they when they use a resource or an information item that's out there, they should cite that, whether that's a data set, a video recording, an article, or what have you. And that's, I think that's, that, that is one reason also why um, repositories like Aura, Pickshare, issue DOIs to articles so that there's no confusion of what, it, what data source it is that is being cited. But that it doesn't prevent that somebody can take data that has been published and um, create new research out of that. In fact, from the funder's perspective, that is the idea of why they're requiring the sharing of data so it can be repurposed and reused for other research. And I think one other possibility, um, and I don't know enough about funders to know if they have requirements regarding licensing, but a Creative Commons license would also be another approach to help uh, let people know the conditions under which they can use, reuse um, your materials. Um, so for example, one of the settings that you can set on a, a Creative Commons license is non-derivative, which means you can't make your own uh, 
in this case, like graphs, charts, data sets based on my data, um, because that would be a derivation of the research data. And that if you put it as non-derivative, that's not within your Creative Commons agreement. Um, that said, I have a strong suspicion that funders probably uh, would prefer a much more open license, again, for the same reasons that Stefan outlined of wanting to make data available. But that would be another way uh, or something that you could negotiate potentially with the funders to make it available, but also set limitations on its use. I'll just add to that. In particular, there's one um, element for the Creative Commons license, Creative Commons license, sorry, which stipulates no commercial reuse of the resource is allowed. So we, you, you can say that um, I make this available, this data set or whatever you're making available with a Creative Commons license with a non-commercial attribute. And that means that anybody who takes that research output and makes money off of it would be violating that license immediately with all the consequences that could have for them. So there was another question in the chat. Um, from Amara asking, can you talk a little bit more or can I talk a little bit more about the types of qualitative data that are typically included in a repository beyond grant compliance? Um, what other reasons explain why a qualitative research researcher, excuse me, would share their qualitative data in this modality? So I'm going to put in the chat as everybody else is talking. I went ahead and was looking up um, on the QDR site. This is some of the information that can be found um, on the on the on the repository. So that's something that's really important to note. Um, I will admit that I have not put my data on the on QDR, um, and I I just haven't. I've not had the opportunity to do so. Um, but this is some information about the types of data that can be found on QDR. Um, I'm just trying to get to Stefan. I didn't know if you want to chime in. I would add that, I mean, another reason, which uh, other than grant compliance, could be that a um, journal publisher requires it, that qualitative mm -hmm. data be made publicly accessible for investigation, for, you know, to validate the claims that are made in an empirical article or other work based on that data. And the qualitative data repository employs people who are in particular, I mean, that is part of their training, their background, to review qualitative data before it's made available to make sure it is it does not disclose um, identities or other sensitive information by people, for example, in interview transcripts. Yeah. A couple of other uh, considerations. Um, one is just that the open sharing of information makes for a more equitable information environment. Um, so anytime you're sharing data or research articles, anything that's openly available means that more people can access and use it. And uh, it also helps with uh, re reproducibility, especially with qualitative data. There can be a lot of subjective, not necessarily well bias or other factors, positionality that comes into play when you're going from raw data into analysis um, and making that data available helps other people understand that process of moving from data to analysis and allows other people to draw their own conclusions as well if they want to or contribute in a future project even. Um, so there, there's lots of positive reasons to potentially make your data available. Are there any other questions we can answer? While people think of the questions, I, I, I wanna take the opportunity to say something more about the, the motivation or be, behind sharing qualitative data or the disinclination to do so. And that relates to what Jonathan asked about earlier. So that the, the the, he talked about that tension. Well, the researchers puts a lot of effort into collecting data and wants to get public, multiple publications out of it. The funding agencies so may have other ideas. Um, with qualitative data, I don't have that. I don't have it handy now. But um, there, there has been a discussion and a position paper 
from, I think, the American Political Science Association, from qualitative researchers who are um, looking at this increasing requirement to share qualitative data. And they're saying things like, well, that, that, for example, I'm paraphrasing and I'm, I, I'm not taking sides here. It is impossible to assure that qualitative data is completely anonymized or um, it is nonsense to speak of the replicability of qualitative data because only I, the researcher who interviewed people and so forth can really understand that there's no way to describe it so that it would be replicable to somebody else. So that's another example of those kinds of tensions of between the requirements for data sharing and the views that some researchers have. And while I was talking, we had another question, and so I fulfilled my purpose. And be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> so the, another question from Sylvina about uh, types of data that are supported. Um, virtually any file type is supported. That doesn't mean that it's ideal for all file types. Um, so I think the more specialized your metadata needs are, the less appropriate it would be to use Figshare. And in the case of code, yes, you can upload code. We actually do have someone who uh, zipped up a bunch of code and put a zip file in and then did that DOI reservation. So you can't see it in Aura yet. It's not publicly available. But once their publication is uh, is finalized and published, then you will see some zipped code in, uh, appearing in Aura. Um, however, GitHub is an excellent code repository because it has more granular, meaningful ways to track how people are using your code um, through forks. And I think, I want to say streams or shares, something like that. But as people mo uh, modify your code specifically, it's all tracked within GitHub, where with Figshare, really the only option that you have um, to see the kinds of modifications is if they cite your code and use the DOI. Um, so Different repositories do ha have different functionality, you know, so there are, are different reasons why you might want to use them. Uh, another type of data that's not particularly well supported is audiovisual. So if you had, say, a series of uh, video interviews, um, we can upload those videos, but what uh, we can't put the transcript necessarily um, alongside it, or um, we don't have the functionality to integrate the uh, transcript as meaningfully as some other um, repositories that are specifically made for audiovisual material. Um, another example to pick on Jesse, our geospatial uh, specialist, um, is that there's specific metadata fields for sharing geospatial data where you're going to share like things like coordinates. And Figshare doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't put them in, but there's no specialized field so that they'll be tracked or searchable. Um, so you can put just about anything in, um, but it doesn't mean that it's going to make its way into something that's uh, sortable, findable, searchable easily, other than by straight keyword, if that makes sense. Sure. <laughs> 